Welcome to the Kill the Lion podcast. It's me, Cody Clark. We have a wonderful show for you today. Dean Soups is here. You love his cartoons on YouTube, and I love them too, so uh, we're going to talk to him. Before we talk to him, though, if you like the show, consider supporting us. $2 per month, killthelionfilms.com. You're basically voting with your dollar for our existence, both as a podcast and a film studio. That money helps us do both. And now, Dean Soups. All right, Dean, good to have you on. Hey, Cody, thanks for having me. So I've been really enjoying your your cartoons. Um, I found out about you because of doing the podcast with Trent Linkarski. He gave you a little bit of a shout out, and uh, I checked your stuff out subsequently. And I really enjoyed uh, what you're doing on YouTube. Tell me about what you are doing, how you got started doing these little cartoons. I would describe them as, you know, kind of similar to like a one panel comic, but kind of come to life, that kind of like white background style, just simple uh, drawings on top of a white background. But like you see everything you need to see. You don't see anything you don't need to see. Very simplistic, but very engaging and, and, and funny. How'd you start doing those? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I'm actually working on like expanding them a little bit. So they're not just like these kind of like one panel things. They're more like the minute to two minute range of, of videos. But um, a long time ago, I started an Instagram account called Tongue and Cheek Comics, where I just like it was like a more like an idea bucket where I just draw these really crappy drawings. Like it was more about the idea, more about the joke. I didn't really have like a particular style that I was like working in. I just like, like I said, it was like an idea bucket. And after a few years of doing that, I was like, this is kind of lame. It doesn't really feel like it's me. You know, it doesn't really feel like it's coming from a place that really says something about myself. So I stopped doing that. And then at the beginning of 2020, um, I kind of reinvented it a little bit and like, started um drawing with this new style that you mentioned like the plain white backgrounds and like kind of raw simple line drawings um and kind of like took it in a different direction and that's when I changed my name to Dean Soups and um after about a year doing that and like everybody seems to like it a lot all my followers seem to like it a lot um I had the idea while doing a, a Reddit live session where I was drawing on Reddit live somebody was like you really need to animate these you need to turn these into cartoons and like make a youtube show and at first i was like i don't know if i can do that i really doubted myself but then you know like most things i just tried it i started and like i'm a good enough drawer and i kind of understand like editing software and after effects and all these different things that i've learned over the years and kind of combine all that together to start actually animating stuff well it's coming along really well i'm i'm really enjoying them uh, how did you settle on the Dean Soup's name? Um, it's kind of just random, but as it's become a thing, it like makes more sense to me. I'm like, oh, well, that's actually kind of cool. So my last name is Coots and Soup's just kind of sounds like my last name. But uh, also I, I'm in this like this group chat with my friends. Um, we call ourselves the Soupy Boys just because like... <laughs> like a few years ago like when during like fall weather you know it's like a soupy kind of day and that was back when everybody was just calling everything boys this boys that oh it's a hot boy today oh it's a cold boy today oh it's a soupy boy today and that just means like it's good weather to go get soup and that name just kind of stuck with our group and so yeah i thought it just sounded kind of interesting and um now that it's a thing i realized like i could start calling my videos and my drawings soups so instead of watching a video, you're watching a soup and I release like a soup every week or whatever. That's not something that I've started doing yet, but it's just like a thought that I've had like, oh yeah, like that kind of works with the name, doesn't it? Yeah, just linguistically, it just seems to fit in some inexplainable way. Like it just kind of works. You mentioned a little bit about your process, how you kind of have this like talent stack of uh, after effects and, and just hand drawing as well and this, that and the other. What all goes into making uh, one of your soups, as uh, you refer to them? Well, it starts with the idea and a little bit of writing. Lately, I've been working with Trent Linkarski. That's how me and you connected. Uh, there's a little bit of writing there, but like also a lot of improv, of course. Uh, that's where Trent really shines. So after that, then I, I 
I actually use a pen and paper to draw stuff. I don't, I don't, um, I don't do any like digital drawings or there's a little bit digital enhancement for, for the most part. It's, um, pen and paper. And I try to draw as few drawings as possible. Like the art of cutting corners is like super important in like cranking stuff out. Um, especially with animation because it can become very time consuming very fast. Not to say that it's not time consuming the way I do it, but it's just important to like really think about it before I start drawing and be like, okay, how many frames do I need to show this? Like what kind of movements are they making? Do I really need to show that movement or can I just like make their arm move a little bit instead of making their whole body move, you know, things like that. And then after I draw, there's some like processing and Photoshop where I just kind of clean things up and get it ready for, for editing software. And then I use a combo between After Effects and Premiere to piece it together and add in any extra like keyframes or puppetry kind of stuff. And then, yeah, that's it really. Well, it's a, it's a great style. It, it strikes me as something where somebody could watch that and be like, oh, I could do animation one day. It's not this huge daunting thing. It's not like when you sit down and you watch like a Miyazaki or something and you're like, oh, in a million years, I'm never going to be doing something as complex as that. It, it reminds me a little bit of what, what Joel Haver does with his absinthe uh, technique where, you know, somebody just looks at what he does or looks at what you do and it's it's a way more accessible route towards animation than uh, traditional animation in its various forms. It seems like if you if you look at the you know the the Joel Haver stuff or you look at the Soup stuff, like anybody who wants to do animation can find something on on the spectrum in between them of like something they could do on their computer, and uh, you know it's just it's great to not have to you know, be like Mike Judge and have to do like the, you know, get like a 16 millimeter camera or an eight millimeter or like, and go through like all the frames and like do all that stuff to like put together like an animation. If you want to get your animation career going, it's just a much easier route these days. And, um, I think it opens it up to a lot more people to, uh, do animation for sure. Have you been talking to anyone? Like, I don't know what your big re like, to me, like reach is totally arbitrary and dumb. But like, have you been inspiring anybody? Have you have you heard from anyone who's uh, been checking your stuff out? Because it it feels like if you haven't been like contacted by people that are inspired, you're going to be contacted by people in like weeks, months, whatever. It's just like your stuff is destined to get out there and be enjoyed. Oh yeah, thank you. People kind of reach out sometimes. They don't say like, I want to do this necessarily, but people reach out and they're just like, I love this style. And, you know, like, it's funny that you mentioned Joel Haver's animations because like when I was like, I, I think right around the same time he was really blowing up was like when I started considering animating my drawings. Seeing his stuff was like one of the reasons why I was like, okay, I can do this. Because like, you know, I, I love like Adult Swim kind of animations and like those are all like low budgety. I don't want to say they feel cheap, but they feel they feel low budget, but it totally works with like the kind of humor that they do. And like, so I was really thinking about that kind of stuff when I first started thinking about doing animations. Like I can, you know, I can cut corners and I can use keyframes and I don't have to draw every single thing. And then when I saw Joel's stuff, I was like, here's another guy who's just like doing it. And like, it totally works. You can tell it's probably made by just like one guy, maybe two guys, but like the style just works so well with like that kind of humor. I'm like, yeah, like I can, I can do this. And so I just started trying. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm, it's still early for me. I, I started my YouTube channel just in January, I think. Um, so it's only been around for a few months, but I plan on continue going for, or continuing to go for a long time. And um, as I continue, they're only getting better. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see what people think of it and where it goes. So how did you settle on your your character design? Because you have a certain look to your characters. It's kind of a you know quote unquote ugly design to the uh, looks <laughs> of these characters. They they don't seem to have much going on on the top of their heads as far as like hair or whatever, <laughs> and they're. They just it's kind of like a California raisins type thing where they're just a little bit uh, misshapen. 
Uh, how do you, how did you settle on that design? What are your influences? Uh, what went into uh, um, the creation of that? Looking at a lot of stuff on Instagram when I was in that world, I still am in that world. But you know, like I don't know if you know, like Liana Fink, she's a New Yorker cartoonist. She's very popular on on Instagram, and like she does these like super simple, like really like like kind of like sketchy almost drawings, but they're just pen and paper. And like very free form, but they're really funny. They're more about like the idea and it's less about like the character design, but it's one of those things where the kind of raw style fits with these like kind of raw observations about like her life and like anxiety and society and like all those kinds of things. And there's a lot of people on Instagram doing that kind of thing. And I find myself gravitating towards that and like, but then combining that with kind of more I don't want to say serious like artists but like you mentioned Mike Judge like I I I love King of the Hill it's like one of my favorite shows I definitely take things from there on like how to like kind of make somebody's face look real I I don't know if that's the right word but capture somebody's face with like as little lines as possible and I've also been looking a lot of at like the hands in King of the Hill and I've been like changing how I draw hands based on how they draw, how the animators in that show draw. So it's it's a combo of like those kinds of things. And then animation wise, I mentioned like Adult Swim stuff is like a huge influence on me, like home movies, Tom Goes to the Mayor, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, like those kinds of things where it's just like a really simple, raw, low budget kind of feeling that I think has a place on the internet. And it has had a place on the internet for a long time. And like, you know, you can you can draw this really raw style and have a really cut down animation style and have it still work with what you're doing and have it still connect with people. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's definitely accessible. It's definitely uh, something that people can really key into. And I feel like it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. You mentioned King of the Hill. Um, are you familiar with the King of the Hill kind of style guide, the like do's and don'ts that went around a couple of years back where they, it, it's kind of like a, a slideshow thing where they kind of explain like what the rules are for animating the characters. Did you ever check that out? Hmm. No, I've I've never heard of that. I'll send it to you uh, after the episode. It's it's a really good read. It's, uh, you know, it's basically like a, almost like a, like an index card sized frame like kind of um comic essentially where it's just all the do's and don'ts so like it's like how to draw the characters like don't make peggy too sexy looking or shapely like keep her lines like in a particular way etc and it's just like for every single thing and then when you look at something like that you realize how much goes into animating a show because i feel like people they think about the process and they think about like the technology and stuff like that and like all the frames and whatnot and that's one aspect the other aspect is definitely figuring out what your characters are going to look like what they're not going to look like uh how to draw a particular character's face what things to avoid when drawing their face so it's definitely a good read it's one of those things that um even somebody not necessarily interested in drawing stuff themselves if you like the show or if you like animation in general, it's just a good eye-opening thing for sure. I, I would recommend that. Absolutely. That sounds cool. So you've been you've been collaborating on your on your channel. You've done some stuff with uh, Trent. Um, how do you pick somebody to collaborate? Uh, who do you end up collaborating with, etc.? And uh, is that something you want to do more of going forward? Yeah, it's definitely something I want to do more of. Um, Trent it just kind of worked out perfectly that like, you know, I was watching like Joel's videos and like getting a great kick out of them. And then um, I saw an interview with Joel and Trent with um, another guy you did a podcast with. He's part of he's part of your, you know, like filmmaker crew. Um, Dan? Dan Lotz. Yeah, I I, uh, I was listening to that episode earlier today. Yeah, he, d- he did an interview with Trent and Joel. And in that interview, Trent said like, oh, yeah, I'm starting my own YouTube channel, too. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, there's going to be like sister content to come out that sort of like supplements joel stuff like that'd be cool to watch so i followed him and saw some of the videos that he was posting and it didn't click at first because he he pretty much only does audio based skits and like sketches 
it didn't click at first where I was like, wait a second, this guy's got a great voice and he's funny and he like only does like audio based stuff. I could totally like, I could totally work with him. Like this, this could be great. It took a few videos before it like clicked and I was like, wait a second, like his voice is like perfect for like the kind of style that like I'm doing, like, you know, this like deadpan type of humor that I've got going. And, um, and I was like, is it crazy to reach out to him? I mean, this guy's like a, kind of a celebrity i mean he's in these videos with millions of views is it crazy to reach out to him and see if like he's down to like collaborate and so i did and he got back to me right away and was like i love your stuff and like i think you know it would be awesome to work together and um yeah it's been it's been great so far we um we i think as of now there's only one video published with him but we're working on a couple others like already i actually like just finished one like an hour ago before before hopping on this call. So that'll be getting posted tomorrow, actually. So yeah, I mean, me and Trent are definitely going to do, I think, a lot more stuff together. Um, I think we both like working together a lot. And yeah, I've got my eyes open for just like other things like that. I don't have anybody necessarily that I'm thinking of yet with Trent. It just sort of like happened. I wasn't necessarily looking for somebody. I just like put all these pieces together and was like, oh my God, like this is, this is perfect. Yeah. It always pays to just kind of reach out to people and like, you know, it's, it's just like, it's one of those things where it's like the worst thing they could do is probably just, you know, not respond or, or say no or whatever. It's just like, you might as well just like try, you know, it's, if you're doing something that's interesting, chances are if you think somebody else is doing something interesting, they might like your stuff as well, for sure. And obviously, it it definitely clicked with with you and Trent, which is great. And it's I, I feel like you're just gonna it's just gonna be even more people. You'll just kind of find them here and there, and just do more stuff. Is there like a frequency that you'd like to ideally? do these at because i i know joel had his thing of like you know a short film every week at least one every week um is there a is there a rhythm or or something that you want to get into as far as like releasing these yeah so my goal at the beginning of the year was like i'm gonna try and do 25 videos in 2021 just because like i didn't really know how time consuming they would be i didn't know like yeah, I just I I it was a very cautious goal, which 25 in a year ends up being just about once every 2 weeks. And as of now in what is it? It's oh, it's May now. Cool. As of May of 2021, I'm like way ahead of schedule. Um I'll probably end up doing like 35 videos this year, something like that. So yeah, originally the the goal was once every 2 weeks, but sometimes it's once every week. Other times it's once every three weeks when I'm really busy with other stuff and and working on something a little more ambitious animation wise. But I, I've I've been surprised by how quickly I can turn some of these around. Some ideas I can get done in like two or three days. And then other ideas take like once I really get down to it, they take like maybe ten days or something like that. So I guess once every two weeks is the short answer, but hopefully more than that. Well, once every two weeks in animation is, is definitely impressive for sure. It, it's just such a great thing that you can settle into something that, that is that quick. It's just unheard of, like historically. It, it, it's kind of insane to think about this time period that we're living in where you can basically have your, like this is basically a show, you know, the Dean Soups show. It's It's on the internet, it's on YouTube. But anyone can just watch like any number of these in a row, and what it's it's no different than if they were to watch like a TV show or anything else. It's just like you greenlit yourself. You're you're out there. One of the things I talked to Trent about on the show is that I you know I asked him like, is he getting reached out to by people? Like, like now that these animations are big, is he getting any you know voiceover job offers or any? you know, hey, can you be in my, you know, new animation show or whatever, do like a voice or something? And he's like, no. And I, I just feel like in general, people that I've talked to, friends of mine that have like hit it big in certain areas or with certain things or whatever, nobody ever reaches out to you as much as you think they would. People have this idea that like they're just gatekeepers that are out there and they're just looking for new talent and they 
They're, ju they're just constantly looking for people, and it's just really not that true. Uh, it, it, you know, nobody's really looking for you. You just kind of have to do your thing. And that's why it's great to just kind of reach out to people because it's like, if you understand that like, nobody's getting reached out to as much as they think they would. And if, if you build in your head of like, this person's a success, so they're probably just swamped. It's just like, well, they probably aren't actually swamped. Like, it's probably just like anybody else where they're just kind of doing their own thing and, and, and whatever. But yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy to me that like, you know, Adult Swim isn't knocking down their door or your door or anything. Like, it's just like, it's just such a no-brainer, which just points to the fact that, like, I don't know, the industry might just be on its way out in general. Like, the future might be just smaller channels, and and that could be the Adult Swim of, you know, the next generation or whatever. They might not even care what's on television. Uh, what are your thoughts about the you know, the industry as a whole or where things are going or, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I feel like YouTube is already becoming that it kind of already is that when I was younger, YouTube was like, not really a place you would go to just like watch content the same way you would watch TV. It was more like a viral video every once in a while. And like, I would use my personal YouTube channel to like, almost like a utility. Like when I made a product, like a video for class or something, I would like put it on YouTube so I could show it to the class at school, like later. And now younger kids, like teenagers and stuff, like probably spend more time watching YouTube than like, I mean, at least cable, like maybe not streaming services like Netflix and stuff, but the amount of long form video that's on YouTube now, I mean, whether it's like Mr. Beast who has like 10 minute long videos, 20 minute long videos or like, like tutorial kind of videos that are really long. Or like, I know you have a bunch of feature films on your channel. People are actually going to YouTube to watch that kind of stuff, which was another like motivator for me in starting my channel. Cause I was like, who wants to watch? Like for a long time, I always felt that about YouTube. Like I could start a channel, but like who really wants to watch my crappy little animations or videos, like whatever it is. But coming to this realization that people are watching YouTube, like they're watching TV, I'm like, okay, I can, maybe I can make something that people actually want to watch. So yeah, I think that's interesting. And and I think it opens the door to, I mean, just all kinds of crazy stuff that would just never happen on TV. Like it really is like the Wild West, I guess, in terms of like creativity, where like you can just do whatever you want and like... If it ends up being something that connects with people, then theoretically people will flock to it, which is just crazy. Yeah, when I started out on YouTube, I started out pretty much right when it it started. And uh, YouTube for me, for many many years, it just seemed like a place where you practice, where you you know you try little try little things, and and you get to a familiarity with your camera or whatever you're doing, and you just kind of learn in secret by doing like little comedy shorts or whatever that's that's what i used it for and then when i made my first feature films it never even occurred to me like oh releasing that on youtube like it just didn't seem like the suitable place for that whatsoever and then youtube it kind of just has these peaks and valleys and 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 eras within it that like sometimes youtube is very cynical and very stupid and very like immature and sometimes YouTube is very kind and very awesome. It just has these like waves of like what people are into at the time. And I feel like we're in this great upswing where like it's just very nice on there. I, I've noticed it's very nice and uh, people are chill and it's it's a place where you can release stuff that's finished. That, that That is something that you're like fully proud of and isn't something where you're just kind of like trying something out. Like obviously there's room for trying stuff out there on there as well, but and the fact that it's just this like delivery system now, like for like finished content, great stuff that like a normal person would wish was on TV or that they could watch on Netflix or Amazon or whatever, you know, it's just a place for, for that stuff. And I think, um, you know, people are really appreciating that. And I, as far as content creators and artists and, and, and people that just want to watch stuff as well, it's just this this great kind of like a la carte thing where you just kind of pick your channels and 
and put it together. And I don't think anywhere else can really offer that in any in any real way. So I hope that you know, YouTube stays pretty awesome for the time being. I know these things can go at the drop of a hat. I had, I had issues with Amazon Prime Video and the way that they treat uh, filmmakers on there. It's just like really unfair. The fact that like very recently they, they cut off the made on demand stuff. So anybody that makes a DVD, CD, Blu-ray, whatever through Amazon uh, and in the beginning of June, all that's going away. So we're talking tens of thousands of titles are just immediately out of print. All these people that can't afford to do like small runs of their film or whatever, and we're relying on Amazon. It's just all going away overnight. So suddenly it's just going to be a ghost town over there as far as genuinely like truly independent uh, film content. And I don't expect YouTube to be great forever, but when somewhere is great, I want to spend time on the place when it's great. So like I, I had a good time on Amazon for a couple of years and now I'm having a good time on YouTube, etc. And, uh, you know, I'll jump ship to something else when something presents itself. But right now, YouTube's pretty awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it for sure. Yeah, agreed. I'm liking it so far, too. Yeah, the difference between like Instagram and YouTube, I, there's like a palpable difference between like on Instagram, it's this environment where everybody is creating, everybody's a content creator, but some of that content is just like what you had for breakfast, you know? And so it's really not hard to like gain followers on Instagram, like, because everybody is just sort of there and everybody's like kind of in a weird way, like trying to make it. And on YouTube, there's a lot of content creators who I think take their content a little more seriously. And then there's also a lot of people on YouTube who don't create content at all. They're there to just watch stuff. And so even though I have a very small following right now, I feel like every person who subscribed to me so far is like, oh, wow, like, I love this. I want to see more of this. Whereas I feel like my following on Instagram is a little more like, oh, wait, who's this guy? Oh, yeah, I followed him like a year ago or something like I have some followers on Instagram who really, I think, love my stuff, but I think it's really easy for Instagram to become inflated, follower count to become inflated. YouTube just feels a little more sincere or genuine. Yeah, I think that's a, an important distinction because, you know, on YouTube, if somebody's starting out doing content, you know, maybe they only have a handful of of subscribers and they might get down on themselves because of that, but you know, it's it's people that believe in you, and it's it. Those are your diehards. You know, you you only have maybe over a hundred, little over a hundred subscribers right now. I'm sure it's going to blow up over the course of the year and whatnot. But it's it's a hundred plus people that really believe in what you're doing, and there's there's just so much value to that. And if you start to see it as like actual people, you know, when Joel Haver was starting out, he just kind of interacted with everybody who was subscribing. Because he only had like a couple hundred or a couple thousand subscribers, and that was just what he was able to do. And it was all just diehards. And if you have those diehards in place, when you do get a huge bump because one of your videos does really well, and this influx of people, they're going to see that there's kind of a community built in there already of people that really care about your stuff, and they're just gonna they're they're gonna want to be a part of that for sure. I think. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so I, I think that uh, me and you, we could do a really good extended uh, stupid questions section. So I think we're going to start that about now because I, I, I just feel like we could go on forever with that. So <laughs> if you are ready, sir, would you like to be asked some stupid questions? I am ready to give you some stupid answers. All right, first stupid question. What's your favorite soup? Oh, uh, it's boring, but chicken noodle. Chicken? Are you sick a lot? Are you <laughs> are you constantly uh, in bed? Are you do you constantly have a fever? What's going on there, Dean? I mean, I think I see soup as a comfort food, and um, so while I'm not sick all the time, I feel comforted by chicken noodle soup. Uh, so when I'm in the mood for soup, I I want to be comforted. Now, when you say chicken noodle soup, are you talking about the canned stuff? Are you talking about homemade? How are you going about uh, getting this this fluid into your body? Uh, wherever it will reach me. Rarely cans, but if the mood strikes and I happen to have cans available, then 
then I'll go for it. So if you're if you're in a restaurant, you have no qualms about asking for for a bowl of chicken noodle soup. You're not going to be worried that like, oh man, now this waitress is going to think I'm sick. <laughs> you know, they're going to think I'm like going to a restaurant with a cold. They're going to think I'm one of those people. You know, like it does that enter in your mind at all? Well, I'd say 99% of the time I'm not ordering soup at a restaurant, believe it or not. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, when I do, it's um, they have it on the menu for a reason, and um, I think I think they're understanding. Maybe in the age of COVID, it's a little more touchy, but I don't think I've ordered chicken noodle soup in a restaurant since the pandemic started, so I can't say for sure. I think they have it on the restaurant menu for profiling's sake. You know, I think they're yeah. trying to they're trying to figure out like, all right, who's the guy who's coming in here with a cold? You know, we have to be kind of wary of or whatever, because obviously he's going to order the chicken noodle soup because everyone knows that that's that's uh, the most potent way to um, attack a cold or whatever. You know, it, it just it has this kind of superpower or whatever. This is not accurate medical advice, people. <laughs> if you're listening at home, I don't think there. I think they've like looked into it and there's like no specific thing that like chicken noodle soup does other than comfort for some people. I don't know. So if so if somebody were to make like a Dean soup, would it just be chicken noodle soup? Are you gonna like do anything different for uh, that? Is there anything you would add to it to kind of make it like all right? This is the Dean soup soup. <laughs> um, I think something like chicken noodle would work well, but I feel like there has to be something that you don't want in there in addition to like a very basic soup with like somebody's finger in it or something like that. Like when they found that person's finger and like the Wendy's soup or whatever, like many years ago, like that's a Dean soups, like enjoyable, but there's just something in it that makes you kind of go. Ugh. Right on. And, and is that going to cost like extra because it's, you know, it's got an actual finger in there, you know, that's probably going to be like a thousand dollar soup at a restaurant, you know? I feel like people's fingers doesn't doesn't come cheap, you know? Yeah, no, those, you got to pay a lot for that kind of stuff. Is there any other soup you like? Do you like a tomato soup? Do you like a lentil soup? Are you a lentil man? Yeah, I mean, all the above, decent choices. Um, all kinds of like potato soups or I don't know if beef stew counts as soup, but I love beef stew. It depends on like... Uh, you know, how you're eating it. I feel like it's the presentation, you know? Yeah. Well, here's an interesting question. Here's a dumb question for you. I love when I get asked dumb questions, by the way. <laughs> I feel like in the last couple of weeks, people have been turning it around, turning it around on me, and it's kind of this weird Pandora's box that I've opened. But sure, please. So I don't know if you've ever heard the, the, the debate about whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich, but there's a similar debate whether or not cereal is a soup. I don't think it's a soup. I, I don't know if I'm like offending you by saying that, but <laughs> I, I don't think that that cereal is a soup. How do you how do you feel about it? <sighs> I've I've actually spent a lot more time thinking about whether or not hot dogs are sandwiches, but I think you could classify cereal as a cold soup. See, I don't think I don't think milk is a broth. That that's where I'm drawing the line there. I don't think just just a bowl of milk that doesn't strike me as broth to me. Okay. So all soups have broths. I guess. I mean, I'm sure you're going to name like 50 that don't, but <laughs> don't they? I, I I mean, you know, I'll I'll argue against myself. There are there are, you can go to a Thai restaurant and get coconut milk soups that are delicious. So I'm kind of the asshole here. Or I mean, you mentioned a tomato soup. Does tomato soup have broth in it? I don't I don't know. Or is that just considered a tomato broth? Yeah, you, you you raise an interesting point, and especially with like also potato soups. You know, that's it's mm -hmm, yeah. You know, it, I don't know, man. It's a it's a tough question. It's a hard one, but I'm gonna say cereal is in a soup. I'm gonna say it's kind of its own thing, but I don't know. I'm still undecided. I'm I'm incredibly indecisive, about, especially about these kinds of things. So I'm not gonna put my stake in the ground yet. All right, next stupid question. You have this video about the problem with being named Dean. <laughs> is is that a genuine problem that you, that you have had, or is that just whole cloth, just silliness? 100% a problem my entire life. <laughs> I don't know if it's because of the name Dean or if it's 
my voice doesn't carry or, or something, but it happened when I was a kid, a substitute teacher would ask me my name and I'd say Dean and they go like all those names that I listed in that video are like real, not all of them, but most of them are real responses that I've gotten when having to repeat my name over and over. <laughs> and it still happens today. Like I'll, I'll make a reservation on the phone for, for, for dinner or something. And, um, I'll have to say my name a few times without fail. Yeah, it happens to me with Kobe. People will, people will, for some reason, call me Kobe sometimes. You know, I feel like maybe it's because you know Kobe Bryant's not with us anymore. They just need somebody to fill that that <laughs> hole. You know, yeah. they're hoping like maybe you know I can step in. I can't step in. I'm not very good at basketball, <laughs> but you know, people sometimes call me Kobe. It happens. It's happened throughout my my whole life actually, but. It can be frustrating to be called something you are not. I am not Kobe. You're not uh, uh, any of the Dean variations. You you are Dean, sir. Yes, absolutely. All right, next stupid question. Have you heard of color, sir? Like the concept of color? Yeah, have you have you heard of, uh, you know, <laughs> color? Like the rainbow? Yeah, you know, all those colors that you can use. Let's say if you wanted to illustrate something that looked a bit more like you know, life. Sometimes people put a little color in. Is that is that something you're familiar with? I've heard of it. Yeah, just not a fan, or. <laughs> well, um, I'm still figuring out no color. <laughs> I feel like that's a that's a big step to take, and um, dealing with color before you really figure out shape and all that good stuff. Um, It adds another dimension to it, which is good for the viewer because it makes it more interesting, but it adds another dimension of things that can go wrong, I suppose, or things that aren't going to look as good. I agree, actually. My first film was was black and white, and it was for similar reasons where like, I was using a digital camera and the grain on a digital camera looked better to me in black and white. It looked more like 16 millimeter than if it was in color. Once it was in color, it was just like just looked like video grain and that just kind of looked ugly to me for what I was trying to do. So simplify it, do what, do what looks best for sure. I feel like people are going to, you know, if you ever do switch to doing color someday, people are going to think you sold out or something, you know, (laughs) like you're going to get those diehards that are like, what's with the color, man? (laughs) Oh, my eyes, they hurt. Ah, you know, (laughs) you're just going to get weird reactions for sure. Any, any change, I feel like, you know, Somebody's going to be upset, I feel. Yeah, people don't like change. All right, so next stupid question. What do you think Oprah's doing right now? <laughs> oh, man, I feel like I thought of a bunch, um, a bunch more of these lately, and now I can't remember. Honestly, I'm surprised that's not the cartoon that's like an hour and 30 minutes, you know? Yeah, I could just keep going, <laughs> right? You know, you got the other one on there. You got basically you made a feature film, by the way. You know, you, oh yeah, uh-huh. yeah pointless yeah. loop. That's that's a ninety minute film. I don't rec- recommend people watching the whole thing. You know, like basically you should just skip around a bit. But <laughs> yeah, I, you, I, I I skipped to the end because I wanted to see if there was some giant you know punchline there for me. And uh, there actually is uh, somewhere in the middle. I actually honestly I couldn't tell you where exactly, but somewhere <laughs> somewhere in the middle they take a break. Oh wow! So it like I, I put that in there. Hopefully someday, like a random person actually watches the whole thing and finds that, and is like, "Oh my god!" Like they change it up at the forty-five minute mark or whatever. Wow, I gotta I gotta find that now. That's <laughs> that's exciting. But anyway, back to the question: what What do you think Oprah is doing right now in this moment? Um, I think she's probably trying to figure out the correct way to get rid of her box spring because she just got a new bed frame that doesn't need a box spring anymore. That's a good guess. I have actually, I have a serious answer to this, this question. She is, she is hiding the vast majority of the episodes of her television programming, her, her, her long running television program. She hides these episodes. There's an episode of her show that I remember from my childhood where she had the entire cast of the movie Batman and Robin on the uh, 1997 Batman picture. It was it was Arnold was there, etc. Everybody was there. They were all talking about how great this movie was. 
It was the most enthusiastic episode of television I've ever seen in my life. Oprah's raving about the movie, et cetera, all the cast. It, this is like, it aired like right before the movie came out. Now, that that's a very divisive movie. A lot of people hate it. I actually particularly like the movie. I like the campiness of it. It just works for me. But, you know, that's a very divisive movie. It was very hated. And I cannot find, for the life of me, that episode anywhere. Nobody's taped it. Nobody's uploaded it, whatever. She takes down the episodes that people upload. And I, I, I'm using her specifically, but I'm sure her organization does this. And it's just very frustrating that there's these episodes of her show that you cannot find. And they're like, they're significant. Like, that's that's an amazing thing to see the entire cast of this movie right before it bombs. You know, that's just an awesome thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little pissed at Oprah because of that. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe those episodes don't actually exist. Maybe it's a false memory of the zeitgeist, like um, the Mandala effect. It's the Mandela effect. Mandela man. now effect. You, see, now you're messing with me. <laughs> no, it's, it's Mandala. It's always been Mandala. Um, <laughs> yeah, the bear is the bear. Is it the Berenstein Bears? Berenstein, Berenstein, all that stuff. the The point being, it, it is a real memory. I do remember it. I'm sure other people do as well. I remember facts from that episode. I remember that the reason why uh, Joel Schumacher picked George Clooney was that he was on a plane. And he had a, a magazine that he was reading and he was flipping through it and there was a big picture of George Clooney and he was bored and he just started like drawing a Batman cowl over his face with like a pen. And then he realized, oh man, George Clooney would be a really good Batman. And that's why he chose George Clooney as Batman. And that's a fact I remember from that broadcast <laughs> that I've never heard anywhere else. And I cannot find this episode. There are thousands and thousands, by the way, of uh, episodes of her show that are just gone from existence. They they will never be broadcast anywhere. This was a hugely popular show, and it's just all gone. So that's I think Oprah right now is pissing me off. That's what Oprah's doing right now. She's pissing me off, man. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way. You're taking her side. I can hear it in your voice, man. <laughs> You're like, not everything needs to exist and be out there, man. <laughs> if it's her show, man. Let her do what she wants. See, if you ever want to take your movies off of YouTube, I will not criticize you because it's your choice. And I don't know why I'm taking Oprah's side. Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like we just found out that your your account is like owned by a, you know Harpo <laughs> Harpo yeah. Productions is actually funding Dean Soups. All right, next stupid question. Let's 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 keep this going. Are you a fan of the band Ween? Not particularly, but I know them. You know them personally? No, I know their music. Okay, you know Dean Ween and all that. Yeah, they sound similar. Yeah, no, I mean the guy's name is Dean Ween. I mean his fake name or whatever. Oh, I don't know that. Yeah, well, that's a fact for you. Okay. Dean Ween. It's so one half of the band Ween is Dean Ween. I d- I didn't know that. I learned that, and I learned about George Clooney playing Batman today. You never seen uh, Batman and Robin? I don't know. No, I saw that. I, I the the story you told about the casting that's new. Yeah, it's a great story. I just love the idea of absentmindedly like drawing a cowl on somebody's face in a magazine because you're bored on a plane, and then you're like, "Oh man, Batman! That's my Batman guy." <laughs> All right. So, uh, next stupid question: When are you gonna draw like a hot lady or something? You know, like a <laughs> can you draw like you know a pretty like you know some sort of busty you know anime babe or something can can one of your characters uh encounter like a hot chick honestly i don't know if i can draw a hot person male or female (laughs) it just doesn't really fit with like the style i don't know the style is kind of grotesque like in itself if if somebody looked too beautiful it just might not fit you know it might not look like something that i drew Yeah, the only context I could see it is like if it's like a poster on the wall of like one of your characters, like apartments or something where it's just like you just see like a shapely whatever that's like very simple, like in the background or something. That's the only context I could really see it. I can't see like a character, you know, looking all hot and bothered and and all that front and center. I think I've definitely thought about that before. And I think I mean, I haven't thought about the poster thing, but even in that situation, I feel like it would be funny to have like this pinup model who everybody refers to as like super hot but she very much looks like a frumpy 
lady who's like losing her hair you know that's just like the universe that they exist in yeah exactly that would that would be even better absolutely all right so last stupid question um i don't even have one i'm just gonna do this off the top of my head okay which that's how i started you know when I, when I started stupid questions, they were all off the top of my head, and then over time, I just in a, in a day, I would just come up with stupid questions. You know, they would just pop into me, and I would just have to remember them for when I talked to the person I was talking to. But here's here's a stupid question: what, What's it feel like to be like you're you're a fairly attractive dude? Oh, and you're drawing you're drawing ugly people all day. What what's up with that? Like that's I don't know. It's it's just do you feel like maybe like. As a non-ugly person, you shouldn't be drawn <laughs> such ugly people. Like, I, uh, I love my characters. <laughs> uh, I think there is something really beautiful about them and charming about them. And I don't know, I don't know what I look like, but maybe that's how I feel on the inside. Is like a little bit off center and like, but something about that is endearing you know yeah i think i think everybody can relate to your drawings i think everybody feels a little like oblong and 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 strange and weird and and all that i think it i think it works for it absolutely so dean it was great talking to you everybody if you're listening you haven't seen dean soups yet go on youtube.com slash dean soups watch some of these little cartoons it's really good stuff and uh, any any final words for the the audience listening at home? Nope. <laughs> it's nothing. I, I wish you I just, had something. So much disdain for these people that have listened to you for an hour, man. Everybody that was gonna click, they're just not. They're just not gonna click now. They're like, oh man, he's at, at 109 subscribers. He is jaded already. I don't. He, they're like, I don't want to see one million at this point. If this is him at 109. Just dismissing us. Oh, man. <laughs> He's going to be awful when he gets big and famous. But, Dean, great talking to you. Love the stuff. And uh, I, I can't wait to see uh, your next cartoons. Yeah, thanks, Cody. Thanks for having me. This was uh, a pleasure. Thank you all for listening. And if you love the show, vote with your dollar. $2 per month. Killthelionfilms.com. You support the show and you support the studio. See you soon.